All right, uh, welcome to the afternoon session of this uh, LMS uh, Bath Symposium on Mathematics of Machine Learning. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Philip Petersen from the University of Vienna, where he is an assistant professor. Uh, Philip uh, did his PhD in Berlin, uh, followed by a short postdoc, uh, and then followed by another postdoc uh, in uh, Oxford, uh, before uh, starting in Vienna in 2016, is that correct? That was actually in 2019. So 2019, thank you. Um, Philip uh, actually received uh, already several awards uh, despite uh, the early stage of, of his um, uh, of his career. One of them is the Klaus Körper Preis der uh, GAM in 2017. Um, and uh, he's generally interested in uh, approximation theory and uh, structural properties of neural networks, uh, applications of deep learning and numerical analysis, and among them, I guess, the solution of PDEs. Uh, and applied harmonic analysis, in particular multi-resolution analysis. And uh, today, uh, Philip will talk about the numerical solution of parametric differential equations by deep neural networks. And I'll hand the word over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, thanks to everyone who is here currently, and thanks to the organizers <coughs> for putting this together. It's a lot of fun. I was. Uh, had a lot of fun uh, at the previous talks <coughs> already. So I added this small parentheses around parametric in my title. So if you know the, um, the program, then it's not there. So um, this is because I'm not only going to talk about this, but I will talk mostly about differential equations. Okay, so it's joint work, <coughs> a long list of um, co-authors, I think. I will talk most about, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but um, if so, yes, then we I'm, can. Yes, okay, we can. Great. So I will talk, most of the work that I will talk about is with um, uh, Moritz and Moritz Rastler. Um, so Moritz actually a master student in Berlin, but did a lot of numerical examples, which I'm going to present. Um, all right. So <clears throat> the trend that, also, this work falls into is this what people call or some people call scientific machine learning, um, and that is kind of where you solve classical problems in numerical analysis using machine learning. And I think you can have two goals when you do this, <clears throat> and uh, I think this is very helpful to keep this in mind uh, when you try and interpret the works that are out there. So, on the one hand, you could obviously uh, try to solve a problem that you couldn't do beforehand uh, by now using machine learning instead of something that you do, did before, let's say some model-based approach. And in many cases, and we'll see a couple of them, this is actually improving things tremendously. But then also you can go the other way around, <coughs> which is something that I find quite interesting, is uh, you use these tools from a numerical analysis. Um, and by numerical analysis, I also mean everything that's kind of associated to this. So in a sense, this is also talking about PDEs, I'm talking about inverse problems and so on and so forth. So problems where you have a very good understanding of a model, even though this model might be so complex that in principle, you can quite rarely solve your problems very well. So for example, in the case of a PDE, um, you have a very good understanding of what's happening. Um, maybe you know the re regularity of the solution, you know, Lot, uh, lots of specifications of the solutions of your PDEs, even though it might actually be quite hard to solve them. So this good understanding of the model, you could also try and use to understand then machine learning. Because in machine learning, well, we don't want to have such a strong model assumption because then it would actually be a model-based approach, but we want to have something that's sufficiently complex. And so this falls right in this kind of niche. Okay, so from this perspective, uh, let's, let me talk about a couple of results that are out there uh, where people try and solve PDEs using deep learning. And again, there are these two aspects and you kind of really have to understand these approaches uh, through one of the lenses. <clears throat> so either they're really fully applied and they just want to solve a PDE or they want to use this to understand what's happening in deep learning. 
So I basically put all these names on this um, circle here, um, or ellipsoid, um, even though, so I think things that are on the right, I would consider uh, to be more toward, leaning towards understanding neural networks. Things that are on the left, I would consider to be more uh, solving uh, oriented. This might be a bit controversial. If one of the authors of one of this, these papers is listening right now and thinks this is not at all where he or she belongs. Um, we, we can discuss this later on. Um, but I might want to talk a little bit about these uh, physics-informed neural networks. So this is an approach where uh, you have an, you're trying to find a network which represents essentially the solution of your PDE. So you have given some PDE, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, and then you're now trying to find through essentially stochastic gradient descent-based methods the solution thereof. And you do this essentially by combining this, this network with a loss function that also contains some derivatives and uh, you, you evaluate at certain points and then you're trying to minimize how far off you're currently from the actual PDE. And then there are other methods that go fall in this general framework of being derivative based. So that means the loss function is actually based on the derivative of your network at that point. Uh, such as this deep Ritz method <coughs> by Han and E, and also the DGM. So, um, <coughs> oh, I forgot what the D is for, but it is uh, it's for deep, deep Galerkin method. And then we have on the bottom a different approach, but also kind of related, where now I'm not trying to find the solution of a PDE as a neural network, but what I'm actually trying to find is an operator. So an operator that takes some input to the solution of the PDE. So now I have a discretization. Let's say what, what you see here in blue. I already fixed that. That's going to be the discretization in which I live and where on, on this mesh I'm going to find the solution of my PDE, let's say in a finite element grid, a finite element discretization. Um, and what I'm only learning is a map that goes there. So for these methods, you don't have to uh, compute any derivatives most of the time but you don't have such great understanding of the actual model of these operators. So these are the two worlds and I will talk about both of them. So the basically derivative based approach where you're learning the solution of a PDE as a network, a network is going to be the solution. And the second one where you're learning the operator, the operator that maps to the solution. All right, <clears throat> so before we do all this, did I miss something? Before we do all this, a slide that you've probably seen already a thousand times. Um, what is a neural network in my talk? It's a type of function. It has an input dimension, which is in my case always D. Um, there's going to be a number of layers. <coughs> I call this L. There's an activation function. And in this talk, it's almost always going to be the ReLU. Um, then I have L, large L, many fine linear transforms. I call them TL. And the network is a function of this form. First apply the first uh, a fine linear transform. Then I apply component-wise this activation function and so on and so forth. And what, I'm, what I will usually talk about when I talk about networks is something that's called the architecture of a network, which is essentially just the sequence which has a the first entry that I mentioned, and then all the numbers of neurons. Okay. And so now, how would I solve PDEs using this in the first framework, the derivative-based, let's say, the physics-informed neural networks? I would have a problem of the following form. Uh, let's say f is just a function depending on well, u and the first-order derivatives, second-order, and you name it, how many derivatives of u. You would probably also stipulate some boundary conditions. And then what you want to do is you rewrite this in such a form that it has a minimizer and that minimizer is the solution of this P. Uh, so you, you introduce an energy L and the minimizer of that energy is going to be the solution. <clears throat> so typically you would minimize here over some Sobolev space, could be something else. Um, and what we're doing now is we're replacing this problem by an auxiliary problem where now I'm minimizing over the set of networks with a certain architecture. And I might also want to change the, um, the energy slightly, but it should obviously be related. 
So one example, and this is what happens in these physics informed neural networks, is I choose a couple of collocation points, so x, i, and I evaluate this function f on these collocation points, and then I just take the, the, the squared error. And this is, an, this is something that actually works well, but let's try and understand why it works. And for this to work, what I mean, the first requirement would obviously be that uh, there is a phi, a network, with this architecture, which is actually quite close to this u. That would be the first thing. And the second thing is, I would also have to be able, uh, I should be able to find this u in some way. And this way is um, typically by stochastic gradient descent. So there should be a path from some initialization to the solution, which also actually decreases the energy. These two questions, we can, they're not at all clear in this scenario because this is a complex, complicated energy. Okay, so first of all, <clears throat> let's start uh, reasonably simple by um, understanding how we can uh, represent the solutions of PDEs. And I will go through some very classical results first. So uh, to do this, we need to just very briefly fix what is the complexity of a network, which is essentially something like, yeah, let's, let's just go through it. So remember that this function, the network was a concatenation of finely net transforms and then these activation functions. Okay, so what do I what, what do I know? It's in a finely net map, so I can write it as a matrix plus a shift. Um, and now here I could simply count the number of parameters, non-zero non parameters, say. This would then amount to counting the number of weights. I call this W of this function, which is just the number of non-zero entries of the A's and the B's. And an alternative method to count the complex, or to measure the complexity of the network would be simply to count the numbers of neurons. Both are fine and both give you different, well, often also very similar results, <clears throat> but this is a reasonable notion of complexity. Um, so, ah, okay, it's also not a well defined notion of complexity, but this is all only because um, I was too lazy to introduce networks properly. Here they're only a function and they may have multiple representations. Um, so you can think of just, if I say the number of weights of this network, let's say the smallest as, so of all the representations that there are, pick the one with the fewest um, number of weights. Okay. Um, so if you would solve PDEs, well, in, classical, uh, in the classical sense, then uh, differentiable functions would be something that you would be interested in. And this is a very old result if a function is n times continuously differentiable, and my activation function is something like a higher order ReLU, but this holds in more generality, then I can approximate this um, with networks, and I, can, I know the number of weights and neurons that I need to approximate with error epsilon in the uniform norm, and it scales as epsilon to the minus d over n, which is, first of all, optimal, and second of all, um, the rate that you also would get with free node splines. So it's, um, but it's a very good approximation result. Um, and then more recently, if you use this real approximation, so just the x plus, uh, so positive numbers uh, map to itself and negative numbers map to zero, um, <clears throat> which is the one that most people use, you could get the same rate up to this log factor. Um, and one thing that might be interesting is that here you have a certain fixed number of layers that you need. And in this second result, to achieve this, what you actually need is to have the numbers of layers grow with epsilon going to zero. And the question that if we asked ourselves, and I like to mention this, is what happens, uh, can you actually get this, the lower result also with non-increasing numbers of things? And in fact, you can do that. <coughs> so, um, yeah. What we did here is that similar setup, you have a C beta, so just a somewhat differentiable function. You can approximate up to an error of epsilon, and the rate is exactly what we had before. Only thing is you cannot get, so we could not get P equal to infinity, but um, recently, um, Hyjo, Young, and, and others uh, extended this actually to L infinity approximation. Um, I'm only mentioning this because I want to come back to this result later, so it's a bit disconnected at the moment. But, um, 
So we can, we can get this kind of approximation also with bounded numbers of layers. Okay, but here's maybe the, the important part. <clears throat> you can approximate these functions quite well, but that does not mean that you have any chance of finding them. Uh, because in this case, we're not optimizing the L infinity distance or anything, but we're optimizing some energy L. And so what you could actually have is that you have a solution of your PEU and this energy, so, so that actually the energy here is zero, but there does not exist a sequence of networks. So there may actually be one network that does this, that actually solves the PDE, but there may not be a sequence of networks that even converge there uh, with decreasing energy. And it may be even worse. There may, there may be a sequence that converges to the solution, but only in LP, but it may still not go, uh, uh, the energy may still not go down. So if the energy would be something like the H1 norm, then we could look at this example of um, functions that converge to this blue curve, but they get more and more rough. They still converge, but the energy will go blow up because the energy is based on the derivative. And this is even interesting outside of PDEs because um, maybe I want to have networks that converge also in some kind of a smooth way to a smooth function. If this is not possible at all, then we can actually think about, is this a good function to, uh, to, train, uh, to, to train to approximate, uh, to train to represent? If every approximate of this function is incredibly rough, then this would, be, this would be really bad because then it might not generalize because it jumps wildly around. So we are interested actually in something stronger. We want to know something, we want to have convergence. <clears throat> so I want to have a, a sequence of networks, phi n, that converge to u in a norm that's sufficiently strong. Uh, and this norm should be so strong that if I have convergence there, then also the energies could con should converge. Okay, so we did a first step in this direction. We only looked at the w, so Sobolev norms, convergence and Sobolev norms. Um, so here we have the, the basic idea <coughs> of all the real approximation results is that you first approximate a square function and you do it, um, well, well there's this construction by Yarotsky that gives you an approximation of the square function by a neural network with an error of epsilon and weights and numbers of layers both only grow like a logarithm. I think I miss a square here, but that's maybe not that important. Um, and you can just look at this construction a bit longer, and then you would realize that it would also hold for the W1 infinity norm. Okay, so the basic ingredient for the result before also holds for W1 infinity. So maybe we can extend everything else. And in fact, we can. <coughs> so here's this result uh, where you have a function that is n times differentiable. <coughs> so W and P regular and you can approximate it up to an error of epsilon with a network, and the number of weights of it is uh, basically this familiar term, epsilon to the minus d and then n minus s, so you have to pay a little price, uh, which is exactly this s. So if you want to have w1p, then <clears throat> you don't get the rate that you had for lp, but you get one order less. And I think it's <clears throat> an interesting question that I just, um, so I thought about yesterday and the day before that, and I couldn't come up with a good solution. And I think it might be interesting uh, whether one can get this kind of result with bounded numbers of layers, or if, and I think this is true, <coughs> if to approximate smoothly with ReLUs. So if you, if you always want your path towards a smooth function to be also made of reasonably smooth functions, not exploding in the so left on. If you can only get this with bounded numbers of layers, and I think uh, with unbounded numbers of layers, and I think this is the case. So for smooth approximation, you probably need incredibly deep layers, but I cannot prove this. If someone has an idea, I'd be very happy to talk about this. Um, okay, so we can extend this theme a little bit. We could now, we can do approximation of smooth functions, but we can also, um, basically reapproximate piecewise polynomials. So if I have here this finite element space, which is just, I, I give myself a partition, and then I want to have all functions that are piecewise polynomial of degree P on this partition. I call this SPI, and then tau is my partition. Um, 
then I can approximate every function in this set by a neural network. And the size of that network only depends on the polynomial degree, and in fact, squared, and linearly on the number of pieces. So from this, we can deduce that if I have functions that I can very efficiently represent with finite elements, um, even with varying degree, then I can do the same with uh, neural networks. And so this gives rise to a result like this, where I don't really want to go into detail on these spaces, but this, what I'm defining here is this space, the, these uh, Jevre functions, we can also call it weighted analytic functions. So these are functions that may, where the derivative may blow up um, at some point. And they appear a lot in PDEs if you have, uh, well, especially in two dimensions, if you have um, like domains where you have corners. In the corner, you would usually have a behavior like this. Um, so now these functions have the advantage that with so-called HP finite elements, I can very well approximate them. And I can use this to get the following result. Um, where, so I use results by uh, Dam, <coughs> um, well, everyone up here. Um, where we now get that if a function is of this form, so weighted analytic, the derivative may blow up in one point or so, then I can approximate it with neural networks and the rate is actually exponential in the number of neurons. Or in this case, this is not the number of neurons, this is the number of weights, but it's the um, third square root of the number of weights. And we can actually do the same in higher dimensions. Um, yes. So I want to skip these because it's not published yet. Um, and now I want, also want to talk a little bit about um, parametric problems. So this was the second thing that I outlined at the very beginning. So now I'm not trying to sort, find the solution of a PDE by a network, but I'm trying to find some kind of map from certain parameters to solutions of PDEs. And a problem could look like this. So I have a set of parameters, you call it Y, and I have parameters that are mapped to certain elements in the Hilbert space, but they satisfy this equation where, where L is now hopefully a, a differential operator. And typically the dimensions involved here are quite high. Um, usually maybe the number of parameters is, is a lot, but also if I would discretize the number uh, the this H space, now it's just an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. If I would discretize, I would usually have to take a lot of um, a, a fine mesh, which increases the dimension of the problem dramatically. So that's actually the case. So in, in, uh, if, if L is a linear symmetric, and well, let's just put it also to be coercive, um, differential operator, and I could rewrite the problem that, that I had at the top as a linear problem. As a, it's a linear, linear problem, but probably in a high dimension because this D, that's the number of, um, that's, that's just the size of the discretization, but usually I would want to have a fine mesh to approximate the solution well. So this would be actually a quite large uh, inverse problem, a linear inverse problem. Um, but what is the case in these PDEs quite often is, or in these parametric equations, in many cases, is that the true dimension, intrinsic dimension, is not like D. It's much, uh, much smaller. So quite often there exist reduced spaces, and I will talk about this uh, after, in two slides or so, um, of a certain size that is much smaller. And I can, instead of solving this problem, I can solve this problem. So I just need to invert a much, much smaller matrix. Now, finding this matrix is usually quite complicated. Uh, I mean, there are techniques, but um, yeah. I don't want to say quite complicated because then a, finite, uh, a reduced basis person is going to say it's super easy. But um, let's say this is challenging. Um, we can now show that neural networks under some conditions can do the same thing just by training. So if the following things hold, and in the paper we go through a, a long list of scenarios where it holds, uh, if you have a reasonably small neural network that approximates this map from parameter to this reduced basis stiffness matrix. And that is usually, um, th this map is usually very nice. Um, 
And you can also approximate with a neural network the parameter dependent right hand side. Okay, this uh, map is usually constant, so this is also quite, quite easy. Then uh, you can have a neural network that solves the parametric problem. So it does this. And it solves the parametric problem with the size that is depending mostly on this intrinsic dimension. And the intrinsic dimension, as I said, usually doesn't grow that quickly. In fact, the intrinsic dimension is basically something that uh, we call this combo of n width of the solution manifold of this PDE, of this parametric differential equation. And that is the best fit of that manifold with an n-dimensional linear subspace. Obviously, you could say maybe we can improve this result by just looking at nonlinear uh, n widths. And you would uh, be right that one should do this. It was just a bit too hard for us. Um, so but what this result says is that basically the problem of approximating um, parametric PDEs scales as an intrinsic dimension that's based on the complexity of the solution manifold. Um, and now we just want to study this claim. With, we want to find out if this claim, if we can also see this numerically. So what I'm doing now is I'm looking at a very standard diffusion equation. I have this uh, very, very standard parametric PDE, the parametric diffusion equation. And here I just vary this A. A is now depending on a parameter. So what I'm looking at is maps from this parameter space, which is basically the set of all possible A's, some, somewhat discretized, um, to the solutions UA. Um, I need to also discretize UA and find an element space, but that's it. Um, and now I want to find out how the performance of, if I train a network, I think we train just a regular, 11, I think we have 11 layers or something, and it's even a fully connected network, so nothing fancy at all. If I train this to approximate this map, how does it depend on A? And our theory predicts that it depends on the, um, on the intrinsic dimension of the solution manifold. Um, in this regard, we have three problems. Um, first of all, not only, so I said the approximation of that function depends on the intrinsic dimension of the solution manifold, but an actual problem has more than just approximation in it. There's also an optimization scheme and I also need to fi figure out where to sample. And all of these things interact with each other in some way. So to make a meaningful experiment, I kind of need to account for all these effects in a way. Um, and so the way I account for different uh, like effects of the optimization procedure is that in almost all of these results, we have exactly the same architecture. We only change the parameter space. Uh, so that we hope that this, in this way, optimization is most of the times very similar because it's the same architecture. Um, the sampling procedure we'll talk about at the end of the talk. And the intrinsic dimension is another problem because I said, well, it's maybe the, um, the, the, the Kolmogorov n width. But in fact, uh, the Kolmogorov n width, we most of the times only know asymptotic. Uh, we can est only estimate asymptotically. So what we're doing here is we're constructing now a couple of these parameter spaces that are somewhat semi-ordered, where we can really say, OK, this is definitely harder than the one before it. We cannot really quantify how hard. So most of the results that you're now about to see are more intuition based. OK. Uh, so the first thing we look at are these trigonometric polynomials. <clears throat> so our space of diffusion, uh, diffusion parameters is well, it's a p-dimensional space and multiplied with some trigonometric polynomials. We have a weighting in there, which is indexed by a sigma. And I'll talk about this briefly. Uh, the sigma, basically, if sigma is minus 1, then we would say that if p is large, then these polynomials don't really count that much anymore. And if, p, if i is 1, then we would actually weigh them more. And another thing is this shift, because we want to have um, an elliptic problem. So we have to shift this away from 0. OK, and now we see, actually, and this is not so surprising, that depending on the sigma, these, the, the intrinsic dimension is definitely going to, be, to grow if sigma grows, because then 
this is intrinsically higher dimensional because the more p's I put in there, which is the, the yeah, it's just y is from this cubed, uh, this p dimension of cube. Um, if I if sigma is very small, then at some point it doesn't matter if I add something. But if sigma is, is large, then this will actually influence. And you see this when you look at the error. And what is interesting is that if sigma is minus one, where you would expect that at some point increasing this point at this p would not do anything. Also, really, the error doesn't increase. But also, if sigma is one, it doesn't. So there's definitely a low, the intrinsic dimension of this problem is definitely less than p. It's, it's not exactly p. But if sigma is one, then it does actually explode. OK. Another one there we can actually see quite nicely the dimension of the uh, manifold is when this diffusion set is a chessboard partition. So um, these are now, well, essentially, these are functions that are on a chessboard. You'll see a picture on the next slide on a chessboard. And on every element of the chessboard, I put, put it to yi. And I also add this mu, which is for the diffusion. And in this example, I look what happens if I change the diffusion coefficient. And we see qualitatively different behavior because, I mean, OK, so this is the slope of the behavior of the method with increasing parameter dimension is different depending on this mu. And this is actually quite intuitive if you look at this. So these are some solutions of this problem. Um, and on top, you have a high diffusion coefficient. And on the bottom, you have a low diffusion coefficient. And these are, on the left, you have good results, or average results. And on the right, you have bad performing results, poorly performing results. And you can really see that on the top, things seem to be more connected because the diffusion coefficient is just higher. Um, and on the, on the bottom, there seems to be much more going on that where the different checkerboard uh, elements do not have anything to do with each other. So intrinsically, you would, you, would, you would say that the intrinsic dimension of the manifold down here is higher than up here. Because here, they move more together. And they influence each other stronger, whereas here, they're more separate. And <clears throat> exactly this we can, could see in also the behavior of the, of the method. OK, now the last thing, which I only have in here, and I also need to speed up, um, because, yeah, so we also looked at clip polynomials. They're well known to not have such a high intrinsic dimension. And in fact, we can go here up to parameter dimension 100, which is why I wanted to show it, because this method actually has solves a 100-dimensional approximation problem. And it does not perform particularly badly. Um, OK, error is like 2% in the best case, but it goes up to 7, which, OK, this is not great. Um, this optimization thing, I'm only going to mention very briefly. We chose the number of training points so that, um, I mean, increasing the, the, train, the, the training set, the size of the training set, is always going to improve the results. Um, but between each, uh, at some point between each test case, the ratio doesn't really change anymore. And that's really the point where we put our number of um, test, uh, test sam uh, training samples. So um, we look at the performance of our method for different numbers of training samples. But at some point, the ratio between them doesn't really change anymore. And we really only are interested in which one is harder and which one is simpler. How, do, how does the problem scale with uh, different hyperparameters of the PDE? Um, and at some point, these, the ratios are all the same. So that's why at this point we say, okay, this is a good number of uh, training, uh, training samples. Uh, so let me conclude. <clears throat> so I showed at the beginning something about approximation. And here, for me, it's very important that if you want to solve PDEs or something related, then this classical analysis of an L infinity error or so is not particularly helpful, uh, because it could be that you cannot really even find the solution. That's why we wanted to look at Sobolev norms in this scenario. And if you want to have something that's even more complicated, time, your PDE is of a high order, then you need to also look at high order Sobolev norms. It needs to be so that it actually matches your problem. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah. And so there we can see that for many of these functions, we can actually do it with a real. The second one is more of a numerical study where you see, okay, there's some parametric problems, but we don't really understand this operator that goes from the parameter space to the, to the actual solution. We don't know a lot about its regularity properties or something. Um, but we know that it has a certain intrinsic low dimensionality in some cases. And so now we want to understand how this intrinsic dimensionality uh, influences actually the practical performance and we presented a small numerical study um, where you can see something. Uh, I also have a seminar. I want to, to make a little bit of advertisement. So here you can <coughs> sign up on the mailing list. Next week we have the next, our next talk, which is also on approximation theory of neural networks. So it's going to be interesting for a lot of people. Um, I'm sure that Matthew, who is also an organizer of the seminar, will also mention it on Friday again. So you don't have to write down anything now. And that is everything. Thank you very much.